First of all, thank you very much to Angela, to Christoph, and to Kai, and to Jakob for the invitation to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be at ENS and to see the labs and chat with uh, some of you. It's particularly an honor to be here because a lot of the work that I'll be describing has its original inspiration and motivation in work that's been done over the past decades at ENS. So it's a double pleasure to be here. Um, as uh, Angela said, I'm going to be telling you about experiments in optomechanics. And I will start by trying to motivate the little subfield of optomechanics as a means for studying quantum mechanical effects on surprisingly large scales. I'll try to give you some sense of how we think about that as a problem and why it seems to us that liquid helium is a particularly promising material for building devices out of in this field. I'll talk about two experiments, one that's pretty mature, where we have been studying quantum aspects of the motion of liquid helium inside of optical cavities in close collaboration with Jakob's group. Uh, second, I'll tell you about an experiment that is much less advanced, that is in a much earlier stage, but I think has some interesting promise, um, both in terms of quantum optomechanics and uh, somewhat surprisingly in terms of precision tests of what we know about particle physics. And these are just some photographs of the experiments uh, present, ongoing, and possibly in the future that will make more sense as I move along in my talk. Is the volume OK? Can you hear me? OK, so as I said, one of my main reasons for studying optomechanics is because it gives us uh, an opportunity to explore quantum mechanics in the behavior of relatively large objects, which I look on as sort of an untested regime for quantum mechanics. And so if you're going to test quantum mechanics, for sure the most important thing to say at the outset is, you know, there's no obvious problem. Quantum mechanics is a tremendously successful theory that has provided us with a coherent explanation for the elements that make up the material world around us. It's explained how these elements bind together, how electricity flows through them, how the interactions between these units can lead to various phases of matter. It's provided us with tools for constructing biological materials, industrial materials, imaging techniques, technologi uh, technology that has revolutionized society, and increasingly sophisticated tools built on that technology that eventually have evolved into instruments of increasing precision that can be turned uh, on the universe at large, parts of the universe that are well outside the realm of what we can access with our senses, and also turned back on the theory that gave birth to these technologies in the first place in the form of increasingly precise tests of uh, the underlying ideas of quantum mechanics. So this is a huge success story for any physical theory. Um, at the same time, there are some uh, puzzling aspects of quantum mechanics, um, which I've tried to illustrate a little bit here. From a phenomenological point of view, there are a number of things that we learn can happen according to the laws of quantum mechanics that we usually think of as not happening in the laws of classical mechanics, as illustrated here. But a bit more deeply, as a theory, quantum mechanics has a structure that is um, deeply counterintuitive uh, to an intuition that has been trained on the classical world. For example, things like um, indeterminacy and, and information, which exist in classical physics, but they exist in sort of an emergent, approximate fashion, appear to play a truly fundamental role in quantum mechanics. And uh, the role of locality in quantum mechanics is at least more complicated than it is in classical mechanics. And it's hard to draw a cartoon of these things, but I, I did try my best. Um, so uh, in cartoon fashion, I might represent these by the statement that the wave function of even a few body system and its time evolution cannot easily be implanted in space-time as we think of it if that space-time is going to contain distinct objects, each with properties that are associated uniquely with those objects. So there's no simple way to describe a quantum wave function in terms of the world lines of discrete objects, each with their own identity. Likewise, I would say that the physical description, even just you know, the very tangible, practical time evolution of a physical system is not the same if information about that physical system is stored in another physical system. So this is an illustration of the fundamental role of information in quantum mechanics. And so given a theory with this peculiar structure, it's reasonable to ask you know, what we learn from these insights, what we can do with them, how they limit what we might want to do, um, and more broadly, how it is that a world uh, 
that is classical somehow gets constructed out of ingredients, individual components, all of which are obeying this, uh, this counterintuitive laws of quantum mechanics. And I think we have a much clearer understanding of how that emergence takes place, in part due to experiments carried out here in the program of decoherence and environmental-induced uh, selection and the like. The question that I'm going to ask in this talk, and that is one of the main questions in quantum optomechanics, is whether this classical world has, to some extent, a residue, a leftover of the fact that it is fundamentally built out of quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. This is one of the programs of quantum optomechanics. <coughs> So to motivate uh, sort of both why it is in the simplest picture that a classical world exists and why it is that with careful experiments you might hope to um, distinguish signatures of the quantum ingredients, um, let me give you this illustration here. This is a system that you might see described in any quantum mechanics textbook. It's a harmonic oscillator. Um, in order to talk about a macroscopic classical world, let me pick an oscillator whose mass and resonant frequency are one in natural units, by which I mean the Système International. Uh, one kilogram mass, one hertz frequency. This is a system that we can describe in quantum mechanics, and we can ask of quantum mechanics, what will this system do? And one thing that textbook quantum mechanics tells you is that if you remove all of the energy that you can from this system, and then go and measure its position, your results will be drawn from a Gaussian distribution of finite width. Not so in classical mechanics. Classical mechanics, you remove all the energy. The oscillator is at rest at the bottom of the potential. This is a phenomenon sometimes known as zero-point motion. And one reason why you can walk out of this room at the end of my talk and forget all about this as you drive home or ride a scooter or bicycle home uh, is because the size of this effect. It's just absurdly small in our everyday lives. One kilogram, one hertz, and h-bar gives you a zero-point motion that is non-zero, but it's 10 to the minus 17 meters. And that is just an absurdly small length scale. Well, absurdly small compared to what? Compared to our senses, let's say, our everyday experience, where our most precise sense might be our sense of sight, where the uh, displacement sensitivity scale is set by the wavelength of the light that our eyes respond to. That's about a 10 to the minus 6 meters. And of course, depending on how good your optics are, your resolution will be some factor of order unity times the wavelength. That's the smallest thing you can readily discern with your senses. That story is usually told, but uh, thanks to technology of what I would call classical optics, but sophisticated classical optics with careful material science behind it, it's possible to realize optical instruments made out of centimeter-sized pieces of glass, things that you can hold in your hand. And if you align them carefully and send laser light in, as long as these mirrors are fairly reflective, such that an individual photon, if you like, bounces around in here for many, many times, then by the time it leaks out, it has accumulated an extra phase that is proportional to the displacement of this end mirror, but multiplied by the number of round trips the light has taken. This is a number known as the cavity's finesse, and given good material science, this can be a factor of order a million. This means that when you move this end mirror, not a full micron, but just one one millionth of a micron, the amount of light that reflects from it goes from order unity to order zero. So right now, uh, just with high quality mirrors, this factor of order unity out here determining the resolution of optical displacement measurements is actually 10 to the minus six. Of course, you don't have to wait for your reflected light to go from 100% to 0% to say, ah, this thing has moved. You can also do good electronics and look for small changes on this sharp fringe. And in practice, good electronics means detecting a change in optical power of about 10 parts per billion, which now means that this small numerical factor is actually 14 orders of magnitude. And in experiments uh, here in Paris, it's been possible to use this technology essentially tabletop technology, conventional near-infrared lasers, uh, visible centimeter-sized optics, and monitor the displacement of those optics to a resolution of 10 to, the 20, 10 to the minus 20 meters in one second of averaging time. And this was done in uh, the lab of Pierre-Francois and Antoine uh, here in Paris. And this is just an astonishing number. I mean, first of all, it's just amazing to think of measuring something that, that, that is that small. It's also significantly a factor of a thousand less than the zero-point motion of a one-kilogram object suspended by a one-meter wire. 
ballpark. Um, so that being said, uh, I should also tell you that no one has ever measured the zero point motion of a one kilogram object. And the, but the reason for that is not the smallness of this number. We have access to that. The reason is that there are other things going on that tend to obscure these quantum fluctuations. So if that one kilogram object is at room temperature, it will also be undergoing fluctuations just associated with its Brownian motion. And at room temperature, that would correspond to uh, fluctuations in the displacement that are about a million times larger than the zero point motion. And not only much larger, but also Gaussian distributed. And essentially without any obvious discerning features that it will, would allow you to take it, an instrument like this, apply it to an object like that and say, ah, I saw the little fluctuation that's quantum mechanics. Because all but one part in a million of those fluctuations will be thermal in origin. Nevertheless, in principle, it is possible if you have the right signatures uh, using instrumentation like this. So the basic ingredients to quantum optomechanics is to have very high sensitive high sensitivity optical instrumentation that is somehow coupled to a high quality mechanical oscillator. The quality factor there is important to ensure that the oscillator is as weakly coupled to the thermal bath as possible. It's helpful to have a thermal bath that's as cold as possible, and it's helpful to be able to scatter as much light as possible off of this object without it getting too hot. Um, so if you can meet all of these requirements, you might be able to do an experiment like that. But let me also underscore that the zero point motion, these Gaussian fluctuations, are not exactly the most dramatic signature of the strange structure of quantum mechanics. This is not as dramatic a phenomenon as violating a Bell inequality, say, or measuring a negative Wigner function. So this is sort of a simple quantum effect. Uh, less trivial quantum effects will require not just all of this, but also some strong nonlinearity, something that makes the system not just a harmonic oscillator. Um, so that being said, I think there are three overarching goals for why it's scientifically interesting to explore uh, searches for quantum mechanical behavior in large objects. One is just that it's kind of amazing I am humbled by the fact that Marcus Arndt's group in Vienna can take molecules that look like this and send them flying through a meters long vacuum chamber. And at the end of that vacuum chamber have real physical slits, holes in a wall, and collect the molecules on a fluorescent screen. And each one of these dots is the arrival of a molecule and see the interference pattern that is the interference of this huge thing's center of mass motion. Uh, and if nothing, if this field did nothing but just repeat this experiment with larger and larger objects, I would think that would be an intellectually worthwhile enterprise. At the same time, uh, micromechanical uh, devices are a very robust and sophisticated technology. The prospect of taking that technology and adding quantum mechanical functionality is promising for things like gravitational wave detectors, precision measurements, and the like. Lastly, it is true that basic quantum mechanics remains untested in the behavior of macroscopic massive objects. And there's no necessarily obvious reason to think that any, there will be any surprises in that regime, but it has been conjectured that the Schrodinger equation is maybe just the first term in some uh, uh, more complicated equation of motion that would involve nonlinearities. It's possible that the quantum mechanics of an object that is massive enough to deform space-time around it, an object that's mass enough, massive enough to source its own gravity, would be somehow qualitatively different because it would require a quantum description of the geometry of space-time, which at present we don't have. So these are some of the uh, goals of the field. Optomechanics as a specific approach to quantum a macroscopic quantum phenomena is based on the program laid out uh, originally, as far as I know, uh, by Schrodinger in this letter to Einstein, in which he mentions the idea of taking a photon and having it reflect from a mirror and asking whether or not this thing that had not yet been named entanglement might then be a property of the quantum description of the photon and the mirror that would be recoiling from the reflection of the photon. Um, so this is an idea that's been developed, obviously, in many contexts, including here in Paris. In optomechanics, this is what we try to do, more or less. The idea is that uh, we start with light, which we can probably prepare in some pretty well-defined quantum mechanical state, a microscopic system that we believe is quantum mechanical. 
we put it inside of a system where it undergoes unitary interaction with a degree of freedom that otherwise we might suspect is really just classical, the position of some massive object. Um, unitary evolution generically generates entanglement, and uh, light does not generically interact unitarily with massive objects. When my light absorbs photons, when my eye absorbs photons, I don't necessarily think of myself as being in a quantum superposition. But radiation pressure provides a route for light to reflect off of an object, record information about that object's position, and then go on its way, all via unitary evolution, and so into an entangled state. Now, in, unlike some of the thought experiments that were proposed in the 20s and 30s, we don't have direct access to the macroscopic object's position at the level that we would need. So instead, the usual protocol is to send in light in some specific quantum state, have it interact with the macroscopic oscillator, and then let the light leave again and perform some kind of measurement on the light, which we hope would reveal information about quantum effects in this massive object that's been left behind. Um, so this is the basic program of optomechanics, and I should say I'm 100% happy to take questions as they, as they arise. Um, That's okay, carry on. Okay, carry on. Okay, so this is the story, but of course the technical requirements are the ones that I laid out. You need very high quality optical instrumentation, low temperatures, and the like. If that's your goal, then uh, we were thinking several years ago that if you had to design such an experiment from scratch, liquid helium might be a pretty good material to start working with. Liquid helium is a material that has essentially zero optical loss. It has no chemical or structural defects. It has a 20 electron volt band gap. It really just cannot absorb optical photons. So that immediately removes an important source of heating and difficulties in the experiment. If you're looking for a material uh, that has low mechanical friction, it's interesting that liquid helium has strictly zero viscosity. And it's interesting that you can put it in a dilution refrigerator and cool it quite effectively using conventional cryogenic techniques. Um, at the same time, we've begun uh, a collaboration with Jakob, uh, who has this amazing technique for taking single mode optical fibers, patterning their end faces uh, with a concavity, uh, and then coating these surfaces such that you end up with a high finesse mirror at the end of a uh, a single mode optical fiber. You can then take two of these fibers and point them at each other, end up with a stable electromagnetic resonator. This is a really nice technology. It gives you uh, well-controlled small volume um, cavity modes. For us who work inside of dilution refrigerators, it's nice that this cavity mode is pretty well coupled to the traveling modes inside the fiber. This means you can take two of these fibers, epoxy them into place, and then just run the fibers out the top of the dilution refrigerator, plug them into your breadboard, and uh, there's no, uh, not nearly as many headaches associated with cryogenic operation as you might otherwise expect. So when we build those devices, uh, thanks to Jakob's help, they look something like this. This is a glass ferrule with a hole drilled through it, a fiber is inserted into it, another fiber is inserted into the hole of another glass ferrule, they're aligned using some pretty simple techniques and then epoxied in place. Um, this construction is sufficiently simple. In fact, we find that with basically no in situ alignment other than fixing the rotations of the fibers, you just do this, you epoxy it in place, and you have the 100,000 finesse cavity that the coatings are specified to give you. This construction is sufficiently straightforward that we just build multiple copies. So here are three of them aligned together. These three uh, copies of this fiber cavity are just inside a small metal can. The metal can is bolted to the bottom of a dilution refrigerator, and the only thing that has to go to it are optical fibers, one for each cavity. Um, once you, uh, then there's one uh, stainless steel line to fill the system with liquid helium, and that's it. There are no piezos, not for aligning the cavity, not for aligning the mechanics, not for aligning the input light, nothing. It literally just consists of this uh, disc of metal, one fill line, and optical fibers. And we haven't net tried to do that, but if, you, if there was some pressing reason to build a lot of these, to make an array of them, it would be completely straightforward to put a hundred, even a thousand, inside of a single dilution refrigerator and run them all simultaneously. Um, now, once these cavities are filled with liquid helium, um, 
which is uh, going to be the device I'm going to tell you about in a minute, um, they are essentially unperturbed electromagnetically. So the red data is the resonance of one of these cavities at the base temperature of the dilution refrigerator. The blue is the same cavity after we have filled it with liquid helium. Of course, the cavity resonance frequency shifts because liquid helium has a, uh, a slight index of refraction, so we've put the lines back on top of each other, but there's no broadening of the line. Liquid helium just does not add any new sources of optical loss. Um, so that's the basic device. Um, uh, when it's empty, there's not much that's terribly interesting about it. So as I mentioned, we fill it with superfluid liquid helium. That's in order to get the mechanics. The mechanical degree of freedom uh, is provided by the superfluid helium. And I should say that uh, although fluid mechanics and all the things that can happen in liquid helium is an incredibly complicated and rich field of study, all that we are interested in are the lowest energy excitations in liquid helium, which are just sound waves. If you're familiar with the field, these are what are called first sound waves. They're just conventional density waves whose evolution is governed by a scalar wave equation. Rho here is the density field. Um, and so we have a situation in which the sound waves in the liquid helium satisfy a wave equation that's basically the same as the wave equation that the light satisfies. Uh, and one second. And these two waves satisfy the same boundary conditions. And so if you ask what are the normal modes inside of the cavity, there are the electromagnetic normal modes, the usual standing waves of the cavity. But then there are also the density standing waves, the acoustic standing waves uh, that fill the cavity and have the exact same longitudinal shape, the exact same transverse mode structure. Um, it removes the viscosity. In the normal state, the liquid helium would be like water, and any acoustic mode would uh, be subject to viscous damping. As we see, there's still some damping, but it's, it, you, uh, by removing the viscosity of the fluid, you, you remove most of the damping. No, it's, uh, all this comes for free. This is, uh, this is a little bit more on the technical side, but this is the, one of the best things about these devices. I'll, um, so that's what I'm going to explain right now. Okay, so you, uh, you know, it's just standing waves. You have to have nodes at the mirrors. You put in a half integer of wavelengths, whether that's electric field or density, same story. They will have very different frequencies because the speed of sound and speed of light are very different, but same spatial structure. And they talk to each other. How do they talk to each other? Well, here's the um, intensity of an optical standing wave. I picked just uh, one of the low order optical standing waves. And here is the density of uh, a sound wave. And I picked one of the density stand, uh, standing waves. And what you can see is that light in this optical mode um, mostly spends time at the antinodes. And some of the time it sees too little helium, like right now. And some of the time that light sees too much helium. And helium is compressible. It has an index of refraction. So the index of refraction is getting modulated. And as far as this light is concerned, the index of refraction of the cavity is oscillating at the acoustic vibration frequency. And if that means that the, not the physical length, but the optical length of the cavity is effectively changing. Its index of refraction is changing. And so uh, it doesn't look like this movable end mirror cavity that I showed a few slides ago, but mathematically that's exactly what it is. It's a cavity whose effective length is oscillating at the frequency of some mechanical oscillator. Now if I had drawn this uh, optical mode and I had picked any other standing wave, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the overlap between these two guys would actually be identically zero. Um, Whereas, uh, so one easier way of saying that is you pick any optical standing wave inside the cavity and there is only one acoustic standing wave that overlaps with it. Every other acoustic wave would sometimes be piling up too much helium or too little helium with the light. So this means that every optical mode is coupled to one and only one acoustic mode. And this is a big advantage in the field of optomechanics where often you make some wonderful mechanical oscillator but it has lots of modes, lots of normal uh, modes of vibration that are maybe not the ones uh, that you're interested in. Sometimes we call this the forest of unwanted modes. Okay, so given that we're going to send in light at telecom frequencies with 1515 nanometer light, we're always going to be coupling to sound waves with half the wavelength. 
And given the speed of sound in liquid helium, this means acoustic modes oscillating at 300 megahertz. So that's the basic construction of the device. Um, in terms of what we will actually look for for quantum mechanics, I mean, this whole story is entirely classical, just density modulating the index of refraction. In terms of quantum mechanics, maybe the simplest story that I could tell is the following. If you have an optical cavity and you send in green laser light, you expect to get green laser light back out. But if something in that cavity can oscillate physically in place, then it is going to imprint phase modulation sidebands on the light. This is just classical modulation physics. We don't need to rush to try and apply quantum mechanics to anything here. This is maybe some big, heavy, hot, slow thing. Um, but if we uh, are thinking about where quantum mechanics is going to creep into this picture, if we have a detector here uh, that's studying the exiting light and it goes click with the arrival of each photon, each one of those photons has to choose whether it was green or a red-shifted photon or a blue-shifted photon. And the process of red-shifting or blue-shifting a photon removes or adds energy from somewhere. It comes from the mechanical oscillator. And when you calculate the matrix rate and the matrix elements and the rates for each of these processes, you find that the process of acquiring energy from the mechanical oscillator and lowering the phonon number um, gives you a rate that's proportional to the mean phonon number in the oscillator. Whereas uh, redshifting a photon and depositing one phonon in the oscillator has a rate that is proportional to the mean phonon number plus one. And it's this plus one that somehow involves h bar. It's an energy scale that's associated with the addition or removal of a single phonon from this mechanical oscillator. Even though we didn't directly quantize this, it's a phenomenon that you'll see in the record of light once you believe that light is quantum mechanical. So this is the place that we're going to look uh, for some non-trivial quantum mechanics at the start. Um, now this difference between n and n plus 1 is going to be most obvious when the number of thermal phonons in this oscillator is relatively small. Since we're talking about an oscillator with a frequency of 300 megahertz, we would like it to be as cold as the base temperature of a dilution refrigerator, such that the difference between these two sidebands is actually appreciable. So the measurement actually proceeds more or less as in that cartoon. This is the optical cavity inside the refrigerator filled with liquid helium. We shine one laser light on it. Um, it'll produce some red shifted light, which is more or less resonant on the cavity, some blue shifted light, which is so far detuned from the cavity that we can't really see it. Um, so in order to get access to what the blue sideband is doing, we have a second laser beam whose blue shifted photons are more or less resonant with the cavity. So we have these two different beams coming out of the cavity uh, at different frequencies. Uh, we beat them with a local oscillator, and then we just record the photocurrent paying attention to the beat note between this sideband and the local oscillator and the red sideband and the local oscillator. There's no funny interference tricks with these sidebands overlapping or anything like that. They're just close enough to appear in the bandwidth of our measurement. And when we do that, we record a photocurrent, a heterodyne signal, with these two different uh, sized peaks. And after some careful calibration uh, that involves um, measuring the photon shot noise, the all different kinds of technical noise in these laser sources, amplifier gains, the transmissions of various parts of the optical beam path. We just take exactly that data and calibrate the size of the signal in terms of the size of the sideband peak you would expect if there was one phonon in the acoustic mode. And calibrated in that way, what we see is that the blue sideband is indeed one unit smaller than the red sideband in accordance with the story that I told you before. Um, the fact that we send in light with 1550 nanometer wavelength, and once your light has 1550 nanometer wavelength, it only couples to sound waves with exactly half the wavelength. So that your intensity standing wave lies right on top of your density standing wave. So if you have a de uh, in liquid helium, if you have an acoustic wavelength of this, you have a frequency of that. If you change the frequency of the light, they would change. Yep, the absolutely. Um, so this is um, that signature that I was telling you about, the red and blue sideband differing uh, by, a, fact, by a, a size corresponding to the signal from one phonon. Now there are ways of fooling yourself in this kind of measurement. There are various kinds of artifacts that can lead to these signals 
uh, being imbalanced in this way. But we go through a lot of checks um, looking at, for example, the cross correlations between these signals, how everything depends on the exact frequencies of the lasers, the temperature of the device, so on and so forth. So we're confident in this. Let me show you just a tiny bit of that uh, calibration. This is uh, similar data, now just with the two red and blue sidebands folded on top of each other. And also here is the spectrum of correlations between light in the red sideband and light in the blue sideband, the real and imaginary part of those correlations. And uh, basic optomechanics theory predicts, as I said, that the height of this blue sideband should just be the mean number of quanta in the oscillator. So if I measure that height of the blue sideband as a function of the device temperature, for sure it just grows as the device gets hotter in a manner uh, consistent with uh, what we'd expect from the known device parameters. On the other hand, if I measure these things that are somehow associated with the quantum fluctuations, like the difference between the red and the blue sideband, or the heights of these uh, correlations between the two, then all of these features, the difference here and the heights of these correlations, have size one in units of these phonons, independent of the device's temperature. Um, so we take this as uh, some evidence that these features have their origin in the quantum fluctuations of the optomechanical device, as described by the sort of uh, simple theory that I laid out for you a minute ago. And this is really the end of this part uh, of the talk. So we have an optomechanical system, a volume of liquid helium that's sort of 100 microns by 10 microns by 10 microns. One of its vibrational modes, we are measuring what amounts to a combination of its zero point motion and the quantum back action of the measurement. That's the physical origin of the sideband asymmetry. Um, so I could, again, pause here and take questions on this. Um, but I would also say that uh, one of the caveats in these results is that these phenomena are very much like what I introduced in the early slides of my talk. These are just fluctuations. Um, they are fluctuations that in every respect look like thermal fluctuations. They just have a size that happens to be directly related to h-bar. There's no sort of immediately tangible consequence of the fact that x and p don't commute uh, or that there's some non-local structure in quantum mechanics. To get access to those uh, stronger quantum effects, we need some form of nonlinearity. We need something that isn't just a harmonic oscillator. And the one possible route to accomplishing that as proposed by some other authors using essentially the exact same device that I described here, but taking advantage of a photo detector that really makes a strong projective measurement of the optical field. So every time this detector gives you a click, in principle, it knows whether that click came from an unshifted photon or one that had deposited a phonon in here or one that had absorbed a phonon from the oscillator. Um, if you had access to that knowledge, that would provide you with information about the quantum state of the mechanical oscillator. In the simplest picture, uh, a click here would uh, take the oscillator maybe from its ground state to a one phonon Fox state, a much less classical kind of state. The problem, though, is that these optomechanical interactions are sufficiently weak that it's the small minority of photons that have had their color shifted. And so virtually every click you get here is from an unshifted green photon that provides you with no information whatsoever about the mechanical oscillator state. So it was, provo uh, it was proposed that uh, one simply work very hard uh, to build a really good filter that blocks the unwanted light and only passes light that contains some information about the quantum state of the mechanical oscillator. Um, and this is what we have been working on in our lab. Basically, we have a series of cascaded filter cavities here that provide about 100 decibels of rejection of these unwanted beams. We have now single photon detectors uh, operating back in the cryostat that give us the clicks we're after. And so I'll show you now some very preliminary results from these kinds of measurements. So again, the device uh, consists of a very schematic version, uh, a laser, a cold cavity full of the liquid helium where this scattering between photons and phonons, a lot of filter cavities to block out uh, the unwanted photons, and then a single photon detector back in the cryostat. And the thing that's going to be different is that in the old experiment, we recorded photocurrent for hours and hours and hours. And once you averaged all that and Fourier transform it, you could see a feature that was somehow related to quantum effects. But it was a very much an averaged uh, uh, phenomenon. 
whereas when we uh, record the photons arriving at this photo detector, this is real uh, timing data where these red lines represent the arrival of individual photons. If you zoom in on the signal coming out of the fridge, each one of these sideband photons generates a big pulse. We know when that photon has arrived. And when it has arrived, this is telling you something about the deposition or the extraction of a single phonon at exactly this time from the mechanical oscillator. This is a measurement with a really strong back action, a really strong quantum nonlinearity. So, so far we've just started taking data like this and um, in order to characterize it, uh, we take data in two modes. One in which we just have a single laser going into the cavity, detuned to the blue side of the cavity such that any shifted photons will be resonant with all of our filters and arrive at the detector and give us clicks. And if we plot the rate at which we get clicks as a function of the frequency of this laser, then when the laser's frequency is chosen such that the inelastically scattered sideband photons pass through our system, we get a peak. So basically this peak represents all of these uh, individually detected phonons. The background is some kind of technical background. Um, then when we repeat the measurement but with the laser on the red side, we get data that looks like this, where again this peak represents phonons that have been um, absorbed by this light and converted into upshifted laser light. If we take uh, photon counting data like this and just fit the heights and plot the heights of these two sidebands as a function of the probe laser power, at the very lowest powers we see a difference between these two count rates. This is the same quantum sideband asymmetry I was telling you about before. As you, uh, uh, if you take that as a calibration of phonon number, then this height uh, here would correspond to the number of thermal phonons in the oscillator, which is about one. As we increase the laser power, um, of course the device gets a little bit hotter, and so the signals from both go up. Um, so this is all very preliminary, and this looks uh, more or less like the data I just showed you. So in some sense, uh, and in fact that's true, because all that I'm doing here is plotting the mean rate of photon counts. And that is not really any more revealing than just average photocurrent. The key difference though, though uh, is that within the raw data that's used to generate these plots are the arrival times of every individual photon. And it's known that if you look at the statistics between, say, the arrival of one photon and the next, or the arrival of one red-shifted photon and then the next blue-shifted photon, this statistics can provide a witness for uh, strongly non-classical effects like negativity or non-Gaussianity in the Wigner function of the mechanical oscillator. So this is preliminary characterization that so far has not given us any new physics, but when we actually look at the multipoint uh, correlations between the photon arrivals, we hope to really be able to learn something about stronger quantum effects uh, in these acoustic oscillators. Um, so that's the conclusion of this part of the talk. Yes? Yeah, so the laser power is doing two things. It's heating, which should give you a shift that doesn't depend on it. But there's one other subtle thing, which is that when we take this data, the laser has been red detuned from the cavity. And this has an optical spring effect that tends to um, anti-damp the acoustic mode. And so it makes it look hotter. Whereas when we take the red data, the laser is actually driving the cavity on the red sideband and accomplishes a form of laser cooling and makes the acoustic mode a little bit lower. So this trend is just the heating of the device. The splitting is this dynamical back action optical spring. This line is the theory that it incorporates both of those effects. Okay, so the conclusions here are that we can actually count individual phonons in superfluid helium at about 300 megahertz. The signatures of these records show the same quantum sideband asymmetry, but we hope to use these kinds of measurements to look at stronger quantum effects uh, in the near term. I should say that this phonon-photon counting trick has been used very successfully uh, by groups at Delft and Vienna um, to, start to, to start to look at some of these non-Gaussian quantum effects. So uh, we're happy to just be stealing uh, their excellent ideas. We are applying those ideas, though, to uh, an object that is something like a thousand times more massive. So this is the same kind of physics, but just in a much more macroscopic object. Um, so this is the end of this part of the talk. And um, 
So far, I would say that uh, we're proud of these results. They have worked well. But at the end of the day, the basic device parameters of these experiments is about as good as a very good optomechanical device. There's sort of no amazing manifestation of the wonderful properties of superfluid liquid helium. Our devices still get hot. You know, I showed you. We shine light on them. They get hot. Um, uh, their mechanical quality factors are actually nothing particularly special, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the lesson that we took away from this is that um, really what's happening is the liquid helium is amazing. It is special, but it's confined by conventional materials. It's in a glass box. And the light is confined by conventional mirrors. And the light, they absorb photons, maybe a part per million. The mirrors get a tiny bit hot. And the liquid helium is just touching those hot mirrors. So what we would like is a device that takes full advantage of the superfluids properties um, and uh, a device really in which everything is built entirely out of either superfluid liquid helium or vacuum. So with that goal, the idea was to uh, construct an optomechanical device consisting of a drop of liquid helium, maybe a millimeter in size, that is magnetically levitated in vacuum. Um, the idea here is that uh, a drop of that size would be able to serve as a high finesse optical cavity by trapping light in its whispering gallery modes inside the liquid helium, providing a high finesse cavity in which the light is only confined uh, by helium and its impedance mismatched to the vacuum. A mechanical system consisting of the drop's surface deformations, um, not acoustic uh, energy stored that can radiate out into the bucket material. Um, and a system uh, like this is capable of cooling itself via evaporative cooling, much as a trapped atomic gas cools itself uh, via evaporation into vacuum. And the idea being that at the end of the day, this is really just, a, even though it's an unusual and hopefully uh, successful uh, way of building a device, that this is really just a way of realizing a conventional optomechanical system, a cavity living inside the drop that is stretched and shrunk as the drop sloshes in its shape from prolate to oblate and back and forth. And this is an unusual way to build a device, but I want to emphasize that every aspect of it has already been demonstrated. So powerful magnetic fields can be used to levitate liquid helium. It's known that liquid drops form very nice, smooth surfaces that allow you to put high finesse whispering gallery modes inside of them. And it's known that liquid helium, when it's sprayed out into vacuum, cools itself evaporatively very efficiently uh, to quite low temperatures. So the goal of the project uh, that I'll tell you about briefly in the last few minutes is to combine all three of these into a single device. Um, the basic idea being uh, a wi optical whispering gallery mode in which light is confined in the helium via total internal reflection. Um, whispering gallery cavities are well known. Uh, at the end of the day, they have a finesse that's limited partially by light's ability to leak out of the sphere and partially by the fact that conventional materials like glass just have some absorption. They have some roughness. They have defects and impurities. Um, all of these effects, we think, should be decreased substantially in liquid helium. Um, specifically, we think that the a lifetime of photons trapped inside of liquid helium drops should be limited by the thermally excited surface waves on the drop. We hope that this ends up giving us with a finesse in the order of tens of millions or possibly more. Um, for the mechanical degrees of freedom, of course, the drop that's levitated can slosh back and forth inside of its trap, but that doesn't actually stretch the cavity at all. Mostly what we're interested in is this kind of mode in which the drop surface is changing its shape and so stretching the size of a whispering gallery mode. The resonant frequencies of millimeter sized drops are fairly low. The amount of uh, interaction with the radiation pressure is readily calculable. Um, the one thing that we don't have a good measurement of is the lifetime of photons inside such a drop. Um, it's surprisingly difficult to calculate in this particular regime, but doing our best job, this is a plot of the mechanical resonant frequency, the coupling rate between phonons and photons, and the lifetime of photons in such a drop as a function of the drop size. And if all of this hangs together, certainly the green and blue curves are uncontroversial, but if the cavities are as good as we hope, this is a device that would actually reach uh, the single quantum strong coupling regime of optomechanics, something that hasn't been possible to date. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So, so how did you make this? How much did you have to fix it? And what did you see in the public in this uh, uh, experiment? So you have a lot more possible uh, mechanisms. Yeah, so one very important feature that I hope will be a plus in these devices is there are, is a, a degenerate family of mechanical modes 
uh, at each frequency, and a degenerate family of optical modes. So this will be a strongly multi-mode device. We know something about working with those, and um, hopefully that can be turned to the advantage here. One interesting thing about uh, a levitated drop of liquid helium is that it has a degree of freedom that is not a harmonic oscillator, namely its ability to just simply rotate in place. And free rotation of a macroscopic object uh, is a low energy excitation that can couple to the whispering gallery modes, um, but because it's not a harmonic oscillator, it provides a different uh, set of phenomenon to look for um, in terms of quantum mechanical back action, standard quantum limits, and the like. I won't say much about this except to say it's something we're interested in and working towards. Uh, what I should tell you about is the actual experiment, which consists of uh, somewhat complicated but essentially commercial superconducting magnets that produces a field of 15 tesla, as well as a field gradient that makes it possible to actually lift up a diamagnetic sample like liquid helium. In our experiment, uh, there's a vacuum cell, and the only thing you really need to know about it is that it has two 45-degree mirrors. So when we look up into the cell from the window, we see three copies of everything at the levitation point here. The experiment works by filling the cell with a puddle of liquid helium and then suddenly turning on a pump uh, that evacuates the cell. Um, when that happens, there's a fog that forms of tiny little droplets above the liquid, and there's a competition. The pump is trying to pull all those droplets out. The magnet is trying to hold on to the droplets. Um, and this is, uh, I'm going to show you next a video, looking up through this window, looking up through the puddle of liquid helium. These are the two mirrors at 45 degrees, so you're going to see a triple copy of whatever happens here. In the first seconds of the video, uh, we open the valve to the pump, the fog forms, and the screen will go black. And in the instance after that, you see all these swirling droplets of liquid helium that are coalescing into a larger and larger drop that is suspended magnetically um, in midair, so to speak. At present, this sort of millimeter-sized drop of liquid helium is surrounded by almost an atmosphere of helium gas, but the pumps continue to run and improve the vacuum steadily and steadily uh, in this vacuum chamber. In the first minutes, the drop shrinks, uh, but eventually it, the vacuum gets good enough that every helium atom that leaves makes the drop uh, correspondingly colder, resulting in a reduced rate of evaporation. And what we find is that in videos like this, you can watch for a day. And after some initial shrinking, the drop just looks unchanging. To get a more precise measurement of the drop's evaporation, we measure its diameter interferometrically, just tracking the transmission of a laser beam through the drop. And uh, in a record of, say, thousands of seconds or hours, um, we will see periodic peaks in the transmission. This is the laser light uh, coming onto resonance with me scattering me resonances or whispering gallery mode resonances in the drop as the drop gradually shrinks. So this is an incredibly well-calibrated measurement of the evaporation rate. Each one of these peaks corresponds to the drop circumference shrinking by the wavelength of light. So from that, we know exactly how many atoms per second are leaving the drop. Because liquid helium's latent heat of evaporation and heat capacity are well known, we can say exactly what temperature this corresponds to of liquid helium. In this case, about 340 millikelvin. That's not terribly cold, but I should emphasize this is a drop with something like 35 milliwatts of laser power passing through it. And if you do low temperature experiments, that's a lot of power. Um, we can decrease that laser power, and indeed the evaporation rate goes down, the inferred temperature goes down. Again, because the thermodynamic properties of liquid helium are so well known, we know that if it's at 332 millikelvin, it's being subject to a heat load of 38 picowatts. And since we're shining milliwatts on the drop and seeing picowatts of heating, we know that that's an absorption of parts per billion. We expect it to be actually be much less than that, more like parts per trillion. And we suspect that what's going on is that the laser power is heating up the mirrors inside the cryostat and releasing a bit more helium vapor that would otherwise be absorbed. If you interpret this heat load just as being due to background helium gas atoms, then this corresponds to a pressure it's not quite UHV, but in the 10 to the minus 8s. So pretty high vacuum for this kind of experiment. We can add a second laser that's modulated in time to try and shake the drop via electrostriction or dipole forces and measure the drop's resonances. These are the low order surface modes. And you see them here for the L equals 2, L equals 3. These are all just the different standing waves that you can fit on the surface of a sphere. <clears throat> 
if I plot those resonant frequencies as a function of the drop size and the order of the standing wave, this agrees extremely well with uh, just classical hydrodynamics. If anyone is interested in a precision measurement of the surface tension of liquid helium, please come talk to me. I think we could do it, but I can't think of any particularly good reason uh, to do it. So just let me know. On the other hand, if we measure the line widths of these mechanical modes, they have damping rates in the Hertz level, which is not a particularly high quality factor. Liquid helium is amazing in many respects because you can just calculate an awful lot ab initio. And these green dots show the predicted damping rate. There's no viscosity, but there is nonlinearity that allows a bulk phonon to inelastically scatter off of a surface wave. This leads to a damping that's been well studied uh, here in France, actually. Uh, and the theory gives us this prediction here. This is astonishingly good prediction for an ab initio estimate of a quality factor. Um, and we even think we understand sort of the even odd discrepancies and the little bit of discrepancy here. They have to do with the fact that in our experiment, phonons don't just appear from the bath, scatter, and go away. They actually have a long enough mean free path at these temperatures that they rattle around inside the drop for some extended period of time. Okay. So as I said, this experiment is in its early stages. These are just the basic characterizations of the device. So far, we can make the drops. We can levitate them. They evaporatively cool. We can couple to some of the low finesse whispering gallery modes. The optics, uh, the focusing optics in this experiment just wasn't um, built correctly in the first pass in order to couple into the higher finesse whispering gallery modes. And we've measured the mechanical modes uh, of the drop as well. So this is work that's taken place over a long time, uh, some early work done by these folks. Um, uh, this is the present team, and then Charles Brown, who's worked on both the early phases and the later phases, has just moved on to a postdoc at Berkeley uh, and Dan Stamper Kearns Group. Um, so I think given the time, I will stop here uh, and just thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. I would imagine that we would, but as um, when we first make the drop by turning on the pump, we're lowering the vapor pressure. Um, when that fog forms, probably everything is at about four Kelvin or three Kelvin, but very quickly as we're pumping on it, it gets very cold down to 300 millikelvin. And the initial drop formation process, as you saw it, is quite violent. So we can't really make any careful measurements um, at any temperature except the base temperature. We sort of have to wait for everything to settle, which is then in good vacuum. And at that point, it's quite cold and really a pure superfluid. I'm very impressed. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> but uh, I'd be surprised that you can go lower than 300 milli K, first comment. Yes. So is this sufficient? Uh, um, it is. Uh, so I also agree with you. The you know, evaporative cooling runs out of steam very quickly. So I don't think it's going to get a lot colder. Um, at this temperature, um, uh, so another disadvantage is that the mechanical modes are quite low frequency, tens of hertz. So for things like ground state cooling, this might seem hopeless. There are a couple of things that we're excited about, though. One is that because the mechanical oscillator is so soft and the cavity, we hope, will have quite high finesse, the stiffness that you add to the drop for every photon in the mechanical mode is substantial. So for these estimates, each photon in the mechanical mode should stiffen the mechanical mode by about a hertz. So our hope is that we can take these uh, 25 hertz modes and stiffen them optically up into the tens of kilohertz or even hundreds of kilohertz. At that point, uh, an oscillator at, uh, would be in what we call the resolve sideband regime. That frequency would actually be faster than the rate of leakage of light out of the optical cavity. And that's a regime where it would be feasible to think about ground state cooling. So that's one route to quantum optimal mechanics in this system. Um, another that I didn't have much time to talk about is the rotational motion. So there are a lot of ways in which this rotational motion offers um, nice ways of for example, trying to, using the uh, optical cavity inside the drop to monitor the drop's angular momentum with a resolution that's small enough to see the quantum fluctuations in the angular momentum. And that's a uh, degree of freedom that's just much less coupled to the bath. The rotation of the drop is not as uh, damped by microscopic degrees of freedom. <laughs> 
So hopefully we would be less sensitive to the temperature there. So my other question is about mechanical vibrations, uh, mechanical noise, if you prefer, because uh, for having looked at superfluid helium through my optical fridge for many, many <laughs> decades, <laughs> uh, I remember that uh, to isolate really well from mechanical vibrations is very hard. So it's not a problem for you? It may be, so, you know, these, as you saw, these experiments are pretty crude, just passing a laser beam through the drop. We're not limited by vibrations, but we do have a couple of advantages here. The drop is not in physical contact with the fridge or anything else. J but the magnet is in Fair enough, you know, but the magnet is close to 100 kilograms. It has, uh, you know, the, it's surrounded by high conductivity metal. There's a lot of eddy current damping. Um, this is a pretty favorable environment in which to have low vibrations. Um, so, you know, uh, I agree. Look, we the first round of experiments that I showed you and our history of doing uh, cavity experiments with mechanics in them, uh, we worry about vibrations. And, you know, we know that sometimes uh, they're a problem and you have to do some extra effort to really suppress them. So, um, but our approach has always been kind of to build the experiment and then see... Uh, what you need to do to make it work. Um, anyway, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I mean, th thank you very much for the uh, very excellent talk. Uh, is, uh, uh, is there any interest uh, in doing some sort of amplification of uh, sort of a gain into whenever, because you, you have a system where it would be you could fit back where the effect that uh, obviously we go out of the optical mechanics the way you, the way you described yeah but to to somewhere in I mean with since the uh, you, you store a, a vibration fundamentally into your system but you could actually enhance those uh, because uh, you have in the first kind of experiment uh, you have uh, somehow a way to make pressure on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of people actually who work in doing just that. I mean, this nonlinear interaction between the mecha mechanical motion and the optical motion. Um, this is a, a form of parametric amplification. Um, I, our group has not focused on, mostly we focus the other way, you know, de-amplifying the motion to try and get it to the quantum ground state. Uh, but the fact that you can de-amplify effectively means that you can amplify with relatively low noise. Um, yeah, so just not our group so much, but if you do a literature search, you'll find many people doing optomechanics as various kinds of amplifiers. Other questions? Yes. Um, maybe this is a kind of a silly question, but I was wondering, you've sacrificed quite a lot of finesse by resonating inside of the drop. Could you have a sort of cavity with the drop and kind of compromise your G0 with how much finesse you gain? So our hope is that that compromise will go away. So right now, because of the way the, our lenses are all outside of the cryostat, so we can only focus our light very crudely onto the drop. And when we do that, the light just doesn't seem to get into the most skimming whispering gallery modes, the most whispering modes. It only gets into the modes that are sort of uh, bouncing off the surface at a steeper angle. And those modes are just leakier. So our hope is that with a little bit better focusing optics, we'll couple to the light that really goes skimming around the edge. And our hope is that those will be really high finesse. Um, if that doesn't happen, yes, surrounding the drop with an external cavity is something. But you know, our hope is really to try and do everything inside the drop. Some more questions? So you, you said that you, you didn't did, uh, see the non-commutation non between X and P. But uh, I mean, normally this N versus N plus 1, it's directly the, the commutator of A and A dagger, yes. right? Yes. Which is the same thing than okay. X and P, no? Yes. So, so I, OK, so I apologize. I was maybe a little bit too hasty. So um, it is true that the sideband asymmetry, if you track it back through the equations of motion, it can be naturally ascribed to the non-commutation of X and P. Um, but I guess what we didn't, you know, um, but that's a uh, consequence of non-commutivity that I think is just a little bit different than the ability to have a negative Wigner function. 
So like the fact that you can have a quasi-probability distribution in phase space that is not everywhere positive, I think of as really telling you that there is no meaning to an a priori joint value of x and p. Right? If you have an everywhere positive distribution in phase space, I can just regard that as joint probability of x and p. The negativity of that function is a stronger statement. Um, and I, maybe I was just being a little bit too quick in lumping it all under commutation versus non-commutation. Do you know how much angular momentum your liquid drops have? Um, again, we will soon once the optics in there are improved. What we have done, we would love to know if these drops are rotating. And if so, if they have vortex lines in them or what's going on. Um, at this point, our measurements are just so crude that all we've been able to do is to take video like that and do careful image analysis, you know, edge detection and fitting and the like. And from that, we can tell that the, there is, our measurements are consistent with zero. And I can tell you that there is no more than 100 vortex lines worth of angular momentum in there. That's not very satisfying. Once we can really measure the mechanical modes more precisely or have light in the whispering gallery modes, there are very straightforward ways of characterizing the rotational rate of the drop through Coriolis types of uh, effects and things like that. Is there any interest at doing this experiment with helium-3? Yes, <laughs> very much so. Um, so helium-3, the biggest differences are that uh, the, as regards the rotational motion, in helium-3, the rotation, free rotation of the drop would be rigid body rotation. Um, and being able to sense this at the quantum level would be very cool. Uh, with liquid helium-4, the rotation would have to have a vortex line in it or some kind of structure. There's some technical differences there, though the basic story of quantum back action on the measurement of angular momentum is basically the same. Helium-3 is quite viscous at these temperatures, and so the surface modes, uh, I think, would not be of interest to us. Uh, but for the rotational physics, it could be quite cool. Another small question. I was just wondering why uh, you expect the damping rate of the mechanics to go lower if your drop is larger? Um, uh, technically, actually, the damping rate goes up, but the frequency goes up faster. So I guess what I should have said is that the quality factor is higher in larger drops and your ability to resolve mechanical lines. Your frequency goes up if your size goes up? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, I said that wrong. Uh, the, of course, the frequency goes down as the size goes down, but like the three halves power. Uh, of size. Ah, this is just okay, a consequence okay, right. of capillary waves. Whereas the damping from this kind of uh, phonon, uh, riplon scattering, I forget the scaling with size, but it is uh, such that you end up with higher Q for larger drops. You could probably tell a story about this in terms of surface to volume ratio. The dissipation is because of bulk phonons banging into the surface whereas the mechanical energy is really stored all the way through the drop. Uh, yes, so uh, I, I was wondering, are you going to play the same kind of tricks, like use this uh, phase matching or Brillouin, Brillouin techniques on the droplet, that the matching between the optical wave and the mechanical wave is going to be... Uh, like you're going to have the same number of, uh, of nodes for the optical and mechanical waves there as well? Um, we have thought about that. Right now, our picture is uh, different. It's that the light is going around the equator of the drop, and the equator is just stretching and shrinking like this. Um, if instead we were to think about acoustic modes that involve a sound wave with basically the wavelength of light, a, a phonon whispering gallery mode, yeah, there could be strong coupling there too. Uh, I think, as you know, people have done things like this in glass spheres. Uh, you can play nice tricks with getting the optical and acoustic whispering gallery modes to talk to each other. I think we could do those uh, in liquid helium as well, uh, but it's just something we've thought about less. So let's thank, thank Jeff you. again. Thank you for coming. Thanks a lot.